Hey, do you guys want? Can you guys get it done today? Yeah. Get it done. yeah. If you get if you get it done for the end of the day. <laughs> Khrushchev. Khrushchev. Yeah. Okay, can't be Stalin or Khrushchev. 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 All right. All right. Let's go take your notes off then. <laughs> you know what we should have done? Yeah, I'm not kidding. We get today out. We, we go through the <laughs> Just, just, um, yeah. It's yeah. Go to the bitch line. Go to the school web bedroom. I'm like, yeah. All right, so we are right going through the Truman Doctrine, and the Truman Doctrine. We talked about which ones we get to. Uh, first off, what is it where one con one country falls, y'all fall? Uh, and then it's not only communism is not only ideological, but it's what? Indivisible. Who came up? Or George Keenan was the the godfather of this, so to speak, even though he hated the Truman Doctrine. But what did he thought to, to stop <laughs> communism? It would have to be the policy of what? Containment. Yeah, containment. And then we got to the bipolar world, right? Yeah. yeah. And so next, number five. Once you get this idea that it's a very simple world, good versus bad, the number five one is this. That means that every revolution, heck, every strike, perhaps, any movement that might appear communist, it's being directed from one place or by one person. Every revolution, strike, or movement, and who's directing it? Stalin. Stalin. Uncle Joe. He hated being called Uncle Joe. Stalin did. He doesn't seem like the person. And or the Kremlin. You know, that's where the seat of government is. And so the idea was, is that Stalin was sitting there. In fact, we had this image of Stalin with his pipe. Stalin with his pipe. Dictating all these revolutions. George Keenan. So we imagine this big map. This is what they talked about. This big map. It actually did have this, but it was a little more complex than that. This. And like he's popping on his pipe. And he's going like, today, guerrilla attack in Greece. Tomorrow, a strike in Boston. Saturday, revolution in Argentina. And that's what we envision. He's doing all of this. Now, anybody with even a, even a little bit of, of, of um, thought, just a little bit of nuance in their thought, can realize this is patently ridiculous. Patently ridiculous. Stalin might be an opportunist and might look for ways to get support. But because there's a revolution in Greece, the issues in Greece that led to this have nothing to do with, with what's going on in Italy. Or French Indochina, which would become Vietnam, or for that matter, Wyoming, right? The world is much more complex. Much more. But complex worlds don't make people scared. Complex worlds actually confuse people. To make them scared, you say, we are good, they are evil, and they're coming to kill you. Ah, get them. It's an easy world this way. Truman used his power and the bully pulp, as Teddy Roosevelt said, to convince people of this threat. But what it did was it changed American politics forever. Forever. This will be so big. You notice something. This is domestic politics. This is supposedly foreign policy, but it's domestic politics. Because this is what happens. Truman is saying, 
that the United States will be threatened, weak, if Greece falls. But what happens if there's another event? Let's say someplace else is a communist revolution. Let's say there's someplace else the communists win. Yeah, it could be anywhere. So if we're going to stop in Greece, let's say something happens again in Iran. India, North and South Korea. Can Truman then turn around and say, or any future president? Yeah, that was really important, but but not not this one. Can they? You can't go back. Once you cross the bridge, cross, I'm about to say cross the Rubicon. What's the Rubicon? The reference to who? Caesar. Yeah, Caesar. Once you cross this, you can't go back. Once you say that it is in the best interest of the United States, and the United States will be vulnerable if you don't stop communism in Greece, any place else, then future politicians have to stop communism. Because if they didn't, what would their political opponents say? They're what? Someone said it. Yeah, they're communists or at least sympathizers. In fact, the term they would use over and over again is that they're soft on communism. You're soft on communism. You're a pinko. That was a pinko. You're not quite red. You're pink. So how do they justify social security? Oh, yeah. The most conservative ones would start to attack at the same time. The socialists. But then how did the people who weren't so conservative justify it? We need it. Right. The people, uh, the more, it's going to become liberalism. We'll talk more about that on Monday. But this idea, they're more pragmatic. <laughs> we got to have it. You do what works. Yeah, but when you, if a conservative person attacked you and said, you can social security is communist. That's a valid point. And they would say it works. Because it works. So people want it. So my, that attack might work against other things, but since people love Social Security, can't get rid of them. Yeah? So during the Vietnam War, people were protesting it, when people were like saying they were communist. Oh yeah, and they'd be attacked. Bitter, I mean, really attacked. There'd be counter-protests. There was actually significant more, significantly more violence by the pro-war people than the anti-war. I mean, like, wasn't the nation as as Vietnam. No, not until not until 68, 69. And by then it was clear we weren't gonna win. We're not there yet. So one more thing they would say. Not only soft on communism, not only are there pinkos, but they brought this up time after time after time after time after time. Munich. Munich, 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 Munich. Then. then, yeah. Today they still bring it up and a lot of people don't understand. We're going to talk about that appeasement before World War II. Don't allow another Munich. We must stand up to him. That's the lesson we learned from Hitler. Well, no, that's not. Hitler is not the same thing. But does it matter? Yes. Where did uh, the term come Just read. You're not, you're not a full-fledged communist. And so, every future politician. And so when Ch the... The communist Chinese one in China, and who's going to get blamed in the U.S.? President Truman. He should have stopped it. He lost China. When Castro won in Cuba, who's going to get blamed? Kennedy. Eisenhower. Happened when Eisenhower was president, and then Kennedy would too. So Republicans would accuse Democrats of being soft on communism. The Democrats would accuse uh, would accuse. Uh, Republicans and back and forth. And what happened is it just kept ratcheting this time. And pretty soon, no politician could afford to look soft on communism. You look soft on communism, you might lose election. Even if people didn't even understand what was going on. And this is crucial. This set the precedent. Now we just have to keep going with this. And it happens today. And I think I said this right when the bell was ringing, you replace communists. And replace it with what word? Terrorists. Terrorists. Today, any any effort to cut defense spending will be soft on terrorism, which is actually amazing. 
Because we're building all these weapons that have nothing to do, nothing at all to do with fighting terrorists. Yet you want to cut them, it? Trust me, ICBMs near Great Falls aren't going to be very good against terrorists. There's a terrorist in 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 uh, in Kabul. Let's fire a nuclear missile at him. Wasn't that one of the Taliban that was monarchy things in China that they were supporting during the war wasn't one of those communists the biggest the, the United States was actually helping the communists during the war and then after the war was going against them and that was Mao and we'll mention this tomorrow but it's Chiang Kai-shek who was the nationalist Chinese who were supporting but he was a kind of a two-bit warlord. But like how would you justify that like afterwards? Well what happened is after the after the war we quit supporting Stalin so we could support communists everywhere, oh. including a guy named Ho Chi Minh, which will have serious repercussions in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get back to this thing. Not only this thing, no politician could afford it. What this is going to lead to is a number of big things, the Truman Doctrine. It really is going to change everything. Oh, and I should add, every politician today, everybody in the State Department, when they were educated, when they had their <laughs> formative years, it was all, I don't have it written up there, but all Truman Doctrine. And that is why it just continues even though the Cold War is over. That's what they know about politics. That's what they know about foreign affairs is the Truman Doctrine. Anybody in the State Department today, anybody creating foreign policy for the United States today, their view of the world was shaped by the Truman Doctrine. And so it just continues. So where are they learn School. Like you're sitting down right now. That's where you learn it. They're all in school at this time. You know, President Obama was born when, 1962 or 61? He was in the school. Um, are we currently allied with Russia? We're not enemies either, it's just kind of, yeah, a little adversarial. And so, a couple things are going to come out of this. They're going to be really important. Really important, not only because of domestic politics. What this is going to lead to is, once you get started with this, it's going to lead to an arms race. The United States, once they say we have to stop communism everywhere, you gotta have weapons. The US demobilized after the war. You got to rebuild its military again. Also, once you start building weapons, what's gonna happen? Everyone else does. And when everyone has weapons, eventually, there's gonna be war. There's going to be war. And the US will be involved in these type of wars. Korea, Vietnam, directly, Russia, and Afghanistan. You know, things happen in Afghanistan today, all directly are, are because of the Cold War, and Iraq too. Or what they call proxy wars, where the United States or the West would arm one group against another group that was kind of armed by the communists. Even though Stalin did not support the Greek communists, it was kind of a proxy war. And so there'll be one like Angola. Horrible civil war in Angola, or the Congo, the Zaire and Congo, they never recovered from this. Malaya, it happened. Things like that. Was Laos. Laos is a really good example. Even if Stalin didn't support that, was he arming? No, he wasn't he was arming them. He did not start allowing for arms to go to the Greek communist guerrillas until until the United States started. So once the U.S. started doing it, he started saying. A little bit, but he didn't trust them. But did he do that in general with proxy wars and troops against in, like, independent communist groups? It was it almost always started with independent communist groups. And then Stalin was like, or or when after Stalin died, the Soviets. It was more just opportunistic what you can come up with, you know. But every all those groups, all those revolutions have to have individual problems within the country. They don't actually start from without. That domino theory doesn't work. Oh, I should add one more thing. I mentioned terrorism. That was one of the justifications to invade Iraq. Is the United States, this is what they said, it still kind of blows me away, that it'll be a domino theory but for democracy. And the US will invade Iraq and force them to have a democracy, and then all the countries in the Mideast will have democracies. No. I'm not kidding. And if you look at that, what? So if the US goes in and invades a country, other countries would say, you know, we need a democracy. That looks pretty good. 
No, it doesn't work that way. But they said so. It's amazing how these theories keep recycling. It's like they don't go away. They're called zombie ideas. I think that's a great name. So, now we're committed. 1948, it would be a big year. Not only is it an election year, Truman now has to prove he's tough on communism. He's got to prove it. There's something else. We got to build an armed army again. After the war, the United States demobilized. After the war, the U.S. demobilized. So the army was really shrunk by uh, 1948. A lot of the heavy equipment was basically just thrown away. That's why there's a big joke in this era. You could buy anything military surplus because they had all this equipment from World War II that they basically gave away when people were selling. Them. So there's war surplus. You could buy a cheap war surplus or radios or all this stuff. And if you want really good food, you can buy a can of C or K rations from World War II. Just imagine grease flavored with salt. Yeah, I don't know what you're going. Yeah, I can see it like Pavlov dog. A little bit of drool. All right, so they demobilized. And so the army shrunk. One thing you have to add to this real fast. There's always going to be a post-war depression. What do you do with now 10 million people who are mustered out of the army? <laughs> well, that's coming. What they did is this. I mentioned this once before, but it's one of the greatest post-war maneuvers. Remember, FDR wanted college, at least for the most part, free college. Couldn't get that. But... A very liberal bill called the GI Bill would be passed in 43. So in 45, 46, 47, you have these returning veterans, and what do you do with them? They can go to college. Huge impact on the United States. And so many people join the armed forces today for that GI Bill. In fact, I would say a majority do. You probably know people who do that. You might even be thinking, gosh, college, $400,000 a day. That's called hyperbole. <laughs> I know, unfortunately, it will be there in about three years. No, they advertise. What year was that bill passed? Huh? What 43. Year? Conservatives did not want this. Conservative Democrats and Republicans did not want this. This was a liberal bill. Most of what happened to soldiers when they're kicked out of the army. Yeah. Good luck! So that's a big deal. You know, big deal. I know a lot of people who got, took advantage of this. You know, huge. Is it actually free? Mm, it, it not quite, but you get a significant amount. In two thousand four, or two thousand five, uh, Democrats in Congress got it increased, so it's even more. Um, but it's still not quite. It depends what school you go to, but it's significant. And there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through. A lot of hoops, bureaucracies. No, in commercials they imply college free. All right, so. They demobilized. Well, now I've got to rebuild the army. Don't we? 1948, for the first time in history, the United States started a peacetime draft. Selective service was passed. Why? The threat of communism. But here's the deal. Once you say we need to draft people because of communism, now you've made stopping communism even more important because people are scared. <laughs> now, it wasn't all young men. Young men had to register, and then local draft boards had a quota, and they picked some. It was pretty political. So they, they didn't rent like a lot of it wasn't random. So Yeah, so people with political connections could get out of the draft. They started drafting people. And my dad got drafted in 56. 55. My dad got in my year drafted. Yeah, in the 55, my dad got drafted out of college and got drafted and he would end up going to Germany. You know, part of the, we had almost 900,000 troops in Germany at that time. So we went to Germany. And the Germans in there were just sitting soldiers waiting for the Russian, the big Soviet attack that's coming. So they were just sitting there down the Training. And he was told to watch out for Nazis. Don't go out alone. All right, so the point is, I started a peacetime job. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. Once you start this, that's implying that is the responsibility of all people. That implies you're going to use the army. So it's going to be a drafty army 
in Korea and a draftee army in Vietnam. Well, partially. Partially are draftee and they're called the Texas Reserves. And you can still volunteer at this time. World War II, you could volunteer. But people could volunteer and they were called RAs or regular army. They didn't want to go to the people volunteering trying to get what they wanted. So they just said every young man's drafted, period. It caused problems. It would cause problems in Vietnam. By the way, there's a legacy of this Cold War still today, and all of you young men should know this. What do you have to do when you turn 18? Register, Register for the draft. It's unneeded. It's unnecessary. Why did they do it? Cold War, and nobody wants to say they're soft, so they won't get rid of it. It's just there. It just kind of, it's inertia. It just keeps going. Bad ideas that nobody will get rid of. Since I'm in education, that's all there are for the most part. I get bad ideas from above. Yeah, I'm saying that on film. But, but, and they just don't go away. And why is it problematic? First off, they don't need it. They have all that data from Social Security. They don't need it. And secondly, why aren't women doing this? Yeah. Right? Seriously. Why, why can't women defend the country as well as men? Has anyone ever tried to? What's the reasoning behind not making Conservatives don't. Conservatives are not. Women aren't capable. But obviously, I think women are. In fact, the, the Soviets would find out in World War II, women made unbelievably good snipers. No, because they're like less, um, girls are better if they can concentrate better because they don't have like no. that mu as much adrenaline pumping through them. So guys are a lot better at like close combat because they have all that adrenaline that like makes them do stuff. That's what Gabby told me. Who? Gabby. We should trust Gabby. No, that's actually <laughs> true. You're on the right track. Yeah. Women are more calm. No, 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 this one. <laughs> the best part is, I say something like that, a few people are like, whatever, people are kind of looking at each other, nah, I don't know. Alright, yeah, they were good snipers, and pretty good fighter pilots. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and the Germans captured them, they killed them, with any sniper. Okay, so let's get back to this then. Not only selective service, but then another big bill, also in 1948. The fear is communism. Now remember I told you, when do people revolt? When they're what? Hungry, insecure. Well, after the war, the US thought, all right, you guys, go back at it. Get your economy going and we can step off, step away. It's isolationist. No, the economies of Western Europe were in shambles, absolute shambles for various reasons. And there's always a post-war depression, so that made it worse. And the decision was made, and this was more in line to what George Keenan was thinking. Keenan was not thinking military when he thought contain. Keenan was thinking, will economically contain communism. And it's going to be the, the European Economic Recovery Act. No one called it that. Everybody called it after Truman's new Secretary of State, George Marshall. It's called the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan was a brilliant idea to economically rebuild Western Europe. Yeah. Is this a? Hmm? Is this a place? No, no, this is not part of the Truman Doctrine. Not on this uh, the Truman Doctrine and then we'll find it. If if it's okay, not a big deal. Just take away the numbers. Sorry about that. I get I should have been more clear. And what it was basically is Truman said, we need four hundred billion, just listen, four hundred billion dollars to rebuild Western Europe. Now he knew he wasn't going to get that. He wanted a lot lower. But he said, we must do this to stop communism. If we don't rebuild our economies over your revolt. That's true. And that's kind of what Keenan thought. We get those economies going and show the superiority of the Western ways, we'll contain communism. It turned out to be military. Obviously, we're America, the United States wasn't like that until here. The U.S. was not like that at all. This is going to be the hinge moment in history, 1948. Mm -hmm. It's happened in 1948. And so, because we've already got selective service, so they're starting to rebuild the military. But then the Marshall Plan, what they would get voted was $12.5 billion. 
over three years. Now, it's a lot less than what Truman wanted, but that's how you negotiate. You ever barter with somebody? Either higher or lower, depending you know, if you want to buy something, you say, I'll give you a penny for that. Then you get up to where you want. Yeah. Smart negotiating. And he got this over three years. And it was a shot in the arm to the European economy. It gave him that injection of demand that got things going again in Europe. And it's soon going to be called the European miracle. But the other interesting thing about this, both. The German miracle is going to be even bigger. Part of that money is going to go to the Allied occupation zones. The next year it's going to be called West Germany. Think about it. The U.S. fought to the death against Germany. And now they're turning around and helping rebuild. Remember after Versailles, it was, they were punished. Now we're rebuilding. But only, only the West. Only the West. We're coming to it. We're coming to it because that's going to lead to almost war. Berlin. So it worked. But not only that, it really helped the American economy. See, the American economy was just on the verge of booming after World War II. Just on the earth, on the verge. Where are they going to buy the materials to rebuild Europe? Where are they going to buy it? American. The US. So a significant amount of that money poured back into the United States. Yeah. A whole supply and demand cycle that not only boosted the European economy, but it boosted the American economy. What kind of economics is this, by the way? This is Keynesian economics. And it worked brilliantly. It worked better than anyone could have thought. So we're gonna go back to trickle down. We'll go back to trickle down in the late 70s, early 80s, yes. And we're still in trickle down for the most part. Was that, was that in response to the global war? The trickle down? Yeah. It was, it was response to the inflation of the 70s. And so, 12.5 billion, but that's not all. That was more what Keenan was thinking. But what about the war part? Now we got to rebuild the military. In 1948, this is the law that will change everything. Everything. National, the National Security Act. Oh no! I forgot my staff. You don't care, do you? I just realized I forgot my sandwich. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> There's nothing worse than forgetting your sandwich when you're hungry. And I'm on a 42,000 calorie an hour diet. <laughs> All right, so. It's the only way I can maintain 400 pounds. The National Security Act. The National Security Act was passed, in essence, it's for very logical reasons, but it's going to change the entire course of American history. It's going to put us on a, basically a, co a constant total war footing. It's going to put the United States in the pet in perpetual war. Kind of a low scale war. This is a big deal. This is a wow act. But on the surface, you listen to it, like, oh, that kind of makes sense. You can understand it. So let's go through the parts of it. First off, it created a defense department. There was a separate war and navy department, and that really was unwieldy. Unwieldy. So they went to a defense department. And out of this, they also created a new branch of the armed forces. The Air Force. The Air Force was part of the Army, now they're separate. And this was a big deal because who would deliver the nuclear weapons and all that? Don't tell Marines this because they don't like it, but Marines are part of the Navy. Okay, when did the Marines become like their own, really their own thing? Well, they're always part, they're so part of the Navy. Know, but big six of ones when they were sent into places for big stick. Right. And then you take that to expand that World War II okay. for attack islands. Yeah. Okay. Harrison's Army. Yeah, that was a big train. Uh, then they train the first. They train the first part of the force. Yeah, but they're armed. And Marines are armed. Depends what. So next, number two, intelligence. We had to create some kind of peacetime intelligence. 
some kind of peacetime intelligence because if we're going to contain communism, we got to know who the communists are, right? We got to know where they're strong. We got to know what places might be susceptible to communist attack. So, what did we create? We need yeah. spies. Yeah. No, the FBI was already around. CIA. The CIA. Yeah. The Central Intelligence Agency was created. These are the spies. Now, by law, by law, it can only be espionage. The law has been changed, obviously. Only espionage, that means spy. The CIA was not supposed to be involved in sabotage or assassinations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, oh my gosh. They do, they kill so many people, it's hard to even comprehend. It will blow back. It'll blow back. Blow back means the unintended consequences of intelligence activities. They do something today, it will blow up 10 years from now. Something will happen. They all do. CIA, espionage. And where can they commit espionage? Only overseas. They cannot commit espionage within the US. <laughs> Next. What does the NSA stand for? National Security, Agency. National Security Agency. Same deal, espionage. But the big thing about the NSA was they're more intelligence gathering. So while the CIA might be actual spies, the NSA is more of electronic intelligence gathering information. And same deal, overseas. This is overseas or in other countries, the NSA. Now, if you're going to start gathering communists with potential, or uh, gather intelligence on potential communists, and the fight might be anywhere, the National Security Act would also allow for an internal intelligence gathering. Who would do that? You've already said it. And the FBI would be internal. <coughs> now, on the surface, this makes sense. Makes sense. But then there's part B to this. It fits in with this. If you're going to have intelligence and an increased military, you can't tell the potential enemy what you're doing. And so the National Security Act sets in place that there can be secrets, covert operations. The government must be able to operate in secrecy. They must be able to maintain secrets or a shadow government. They have to be able to. And think about it logically. If you have a spy, you can't announce who the spy is. You're, by the way, Holder's going to be a spy for us in Cuba. Have fun in Cuba, Holder. What's going to happen when he gets to Cuba? Yeah, you might be disappeared. Or they'll just look and laugh at you. You want some information? Ha, 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 ha. And tell you lies. Or we can't say, oh, we figured out that the Soviets are vulnerable to electronic, uh, uh, electronic, electronic surveillance in their embassy. You can't announce that because what would they do? Fix it. Fix it. So you got to have secrets. Does that make sense? You got to have secrets. Just wait. It's coming. Lastly, a minor little thing. Atomic bombs are going to change everything. Even though 48, the U.S. still had a monopoly of the bomb. Everybody knew the Soviets were going to build one. They thought about 10 more years the Soviets would have a bomb. What do you think the Soviets have? 49. Right. Well, think about it in the new era. Now, let's say it's 19, 1950, and we pick up bombers flying over Canada, Soviet bombers on the way to the US, because that's the way they would come over the Arctic. How long do you have? Well, they're slower, so a couple hours. But yeah, limited amount of time. Is there enough time to declare war? Does that make sense? Now think about by the 1960s. Too. And there are intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. We pick them up flying over the Arctic. How long do you have then? 30 minutes. Do you have enough time to declare war? So what? The president needs the right to do what? Declare war. No, the president can't declare war. That's a constitutional thing. But what can the president do? The president can take more like actions if the situation is extreme. In extreme situations, 
Like, who decides that? Huh? Who decides that? The president decides it. Isn't that great? You're coming to the issues here, aren't you? Now, this makes sense. By the way, the United States would spend billions of dollars putting radar installations up here. There's no radar up here, so they put it. So they pick up Soviet bombs. A lot are still there, and now there are big. So, say if they did the second mission, which was launched, like, what would the president do? Or would they just like, what do you announce the problem, right? They probably would announce, but all the announcements would lead to this mass hack. They probably would announce because there's some areas that would be dead. Yeah. But you can think about you announce in New York City. Yeah, the mass panic. Nobody would get out, and everyone's going to die. Seriously, I mean, I grew up with. So, back to this. Now, if there's the last thing Jackson is going to hear before he skips. No pitching. No pitching. But before he leaves, who has all this power? Executive branch. Executive branch. Executive branch. Executive branch. President can keep secrets. President global war. This is going to dramatically increase the power of the president. Now the president can act like an emperor. This is why he's going to call it, last thing you hear, the imperial presence. You get this term. They can do anything they want. Hey, wait. Jackson. Chapter 30, Monday. Sunday, yesterday. Chapter 30, Monday. Right? What are we going to have on Monday? Quiz. The quiz might involve a brainstorm list, and you might have to write a thesis. What does Mike mean? You will. Good practice. Mo and by the way, I look, most of the thesis statements were good. It's just a, I'm not kidding. Just one little minor shift, and I think you would have had no problem with it. Back to this. The president has to do whatever the president wants. Because think about it for a second. Don't bug Hannah. Don't bug her. <laughs> you don't want her to get mad. Like a typhoon. <laughs> so, if how soon do you suppose the CIA would be involved in sabotage? About a week. Actually, it took about five years. But as soon as there's another president, and how could they break the law? They can keep secrets because they can keep secrets. How soon do you think it was for the NSA started spying on American citizens? How about a year? Right? How soon do you think the president? might order the CIA to spy on, or the FBI, or the NSA to spy on potential political enemies just to dig up dirt. How soon? The next election. By the 1950s. It took, Truman didn't like that. Truman wasn't like that. But by, by the 50s, oh yeah. How soon do you think it was where they're assassinating world leaders? By 53. Think about it for a second. How would you know? Hmm? Who was assassinated then? The head of um, Nazis involved the assassination of the president of Iraq. Yeah. Oh, there's so many things. You wonder well, why are there so many problems? And I'll just give you the highlights and or lowlights. Yeah. But you're talking about the NSA spying on citizens. Oh yeah. How would I? Like I can understand how they do it now, but how would they go about like spying? Watch out. Just listen. Except Mark. That's something you just said. There. Martin Luther King, from Martin Luther King, when he became famous in '56, the FBI and the CIA spied on every single movie he made. Everything he did, they put cameras in every room he was in. They bugged him. Everything. In 1963, the FBI sent an anonymous letter to Martin Luther King, and they were going to expose extramarital affairs he was having. He had a lot of extramarital affairs, and if you're filming this, he may know all about it. And they said, we're going to expose this, so you only have one choice, commit suicide. What? Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. So you think about how this can happen. Uh, don't forget, uh, warp sales at $10 a ticket are, uh, this is last uh, lunchtime to buy more tickets, or $10 at the door tonight. Uh, please come by and support your sophomore class. Sophomore class, uh, more sales support uh, prom, which supports ultimately your Who is this human on our? I can't recognize the voice. Graduation speaker. See you all there. some random person just came in and started talking? 
Oh, I'd like to make an hour, but sure, here's the button. <laughs> yeah. He, he said, no, I won't back down. He called their bluff. Because if the FBI announced this, then they would have to acknowledge that they've been illegally wiretapping. So, you know, King was an interesting man, and uh, he was brave, incredibly brave. Braver, you know, almost anybody. He said, yeah, I just got to take it. And by the way, you think about extramarital affairs and things like that, you're going to have great people that do great things and are poor and honorable in a lot of ways, but they're also human. So they might have other problems, too. Nobody is perfect. Hey, that's a lesson for all of you. Just because you're not perfect doesn't mean you can't do great things. I know we in here are perfect and make no mistakes. I hate when the hero worship thing is people and they take away their faults. Gandhi was one weird guy. But if you watch the movie Gandhi, you don't know that he's a saint. Mary was here. Maybe you just missed for the day. I hated Mary was here. 